and the grandest devotional poetry in Sanskrit literature. You know, really, uh, if you look at religion in a broad perspective, it has four levels of evolution. If you take kindergarten to, let us say, Harvard or Stanford, at the kindergarten level, rituals, external practices, ceremonials, prayers, prayers done in congregation, not as part of individual spiritual quest, but more as a so kind of social discipline uniformly performed by a large number of devotees. And then mythology to support these prayers and these external practices. And the third level of evolution, philosophy or metaphysics. And at the highest level, mysticism or intimate inter, in, inner experience of what theologies and philosophical systems try to explain because philosophies and theological systems cannot really explain experience because experience is something that, that can only be experienced, cannot be explained. This is what is called mysticism, the inner experience. That's the last point of spiritual quest, evolution of spiritual life. Now, in Christian theological tradition, perhaps Eckhart is the only figure who combined in his life both mysticism and a philosophical doctrine that comes very close to non-dualistic philosophy as expounded by Shankaracharya. Shankaracharya expounded his philosophy through his commentaries on the Upanishads, Gita and Brahma Sutras, 10 Upanishads, 10 commentaries, Brahma Sutras and Gita. And Eckhart's major work is Opus Tripathian, his sermons. He was a great theologian, a great philosopher. He belonged to the Dominican order. That's why he was persecuted to the end of his life by the Franciscans. He was a theologian, philosopher, and also a mystic all rolled into one. He lived, let's say, between 1250 to 1327, almost 500 years after Shankaracharya. Shankaracharya belonged to the early part of 8th century Eden. And Eckhart lived in 13th century. The difference is that Shankaracharya was a university of spiritual education. We know what it means. In his, among his works, you find small, little books, primary books, primers. Sometimes you know, only about 20 pages, 30 pages. And simple poems, and also the most profound philosophical works ever written in Oriental tradition. And along with that, he is a founder of no less than 10 monastic orders. Six of them continue to flourish to our times. And in our own Ramakrishna mission tradition, belongs to one of those six still active monastic orders, the Puri Sampradaya, Sri Ramakrishna's teacher who gave him, who ordained him into sannyasa, was one of the monks belonging to one of the 10 monastic orders founded by Shankaracharya. Another difference is Eckhart was the greatest mystic known to Christian tradition, was persecuted because sainthood had to be conferred upon a great saint 
by a ecclesiastical office which may not be represented by a person who may be himself be a saint very often. So he, had, he was called uh, by the Pope, but uh, we don't know what really happened. He had to prove his doctrines, great interpretations of biblical literature in mystical philosophical language. And he was uh, accused of heresy, going against the central doctrines of the Holy Trinity, the doctrines uh, originally expounded by Augustine. And he was persecuted by the clergy, the senior clergy belonging to the Franciscan order, though he was protected by the bishop belonging to the Dominican order to which he belonged. But then we don't know what really happened. He, it, sees, it, it is said that he disappeared in one version. Another version is that he died a natural death on his way to face the, uh, I mean, the verdict by the ecclesiastical authorities. In Shankara's case, what happened? He was considered elevated to the status of an incarnation of God. There are uh, three great um, interpretations of Shankaracharya's personality and mystic, his mystical teachings in English language. One by Swami Vivekananda, another by Dr. Radhakrishnan in his second volume of Indian philosophy where he expounds Shankaracharya's philosophy. And the third one, which I'm going to refer to now, is by Sister Nivedita, Miss Margaret Nogum, was born in Ireland of Scottish descent, and he's one of the greatest Western Vedantins, was a great uh, devotee, a great thinker, uh, and a great seeker of truth even before she met Swami Vivekananda, and she has written many wonderful books. One of those books is The Web of Indian Life, where in the most moving words that English language can use to capture the personality, the mysticism, the spiritual grandeur of Shankaracharya, where she writes, it is from the Web of Indian Life by Sister Nibedida, Miss Margaret Nogul, the great disciple of Swami Vivekananda. In fact, in our Olima Memorial Day, one of the presentations will be on the life and teachings of Sister Nibedida, where she uh, analyzes and sums up the contributions in the personality of Shankaracharya. Western people can hardly imagine a personality such as that of Shankaracharya. In the course of so few years, you have nominated the founders of no less than 10 great religious orders, monastic orders, of which six have fully retained their prestige to the present day. She uses the word four, but actually six of those monastic orders are still very much active and flourishing in India to have acquired such a mass of Sanskrit learning as to create a distinct philosophy and impress himself on the scholarly imagination of India in a preeminence that 1200 years have not suffixed to shake. To have written poems whose grandeur makes them unmistakable, even to the foreign and unlearned ear. People who wanted to meditate frequently listen to Shankaracharya's poem. Not those who know Sanskrit language, those who don't know Sanskrit language. The symphony and integration of sense and sound, which makes it a unique inner musical symphony is so helpful. So if you go to the Himalayan monasteries where there are uh, 
uh, hundreds of spiritual seekers from all over the world, mostly from Western countries, listen to Shankaracharya's songs, uh, poems being sung by the, just recording before they meditate. <coughs> That's why Sister Nivedda says to have written poems whose grandeur makes them unmistakable even to the foreign uh, unlearned ear. And at, at the same time, to have lived with his disciples in all the radiant joy and simple pathos of the saints, this is a greatness that we may appreciate but cannot understand. We contemplate with wonder and delight the devotion of St. Francis of Assisi, the intellect of Abelard, the force and wisdom of Martin Luther, and the political efficiency of Ignatius Loyola, the founder of Jesuit, the order of Jesuits. But who could imagine all these united in one person? This is Sister Nivedida on Shankaracharya's life and personality. Now we'll come to the subject straight away. <coughs> Now coming to Eckhart, you know, one of the most uh, distinct features of Eckhart's theology was that he tried to expound the transcendental by combining paradoxical expressions. I shall try to explain what this actually means. So before going to Eckhart, I shall uh, give a sample of this practice of combining paradoxical expressions to, to demonstrate that the reality is beyond words. Now, <clears throat> suppose you want to tell somebody it cannot be explained. Well, it's okay in normal conversation, but in my mystical and philosophical works, the fact that the experience is beyond expression or words or explanation is shown by saying, by explaining it, by trying to explain, it cannot be explained, by using mutually contradictory terms. To give an example, I shall give an example. In the, the most, of course, there are uh, hundreds of examples in the Vedic literature. One of the most famous ones I am quoting, I shall try to explain in English <coughs> to the best possible level. Okay. Now, nanta prakyam, na bhish prakyam, na ubhayada prakyam, na prakyana ghanam, na prakyam, na prakyam, adrishyam, abhyavakaryam, agrahyam, alakshanam, achindyam, abhyapadeshim, ekatma pratesaram, Prapanchopashamam, Shantam, Shivam, Advedam, Chadurtham, Manyandesa, Atma, Saviknyayaka. This is what Eckhart calls the path of negation. So, he says, the reality cannot be explained. So, what he used was a combination of two different words which are apparently mutually in contradiction. So he says, for example, so it is called, you know, uh, the path of negation. So he says, God is beyond qualities. And God is also with qualities, which means God is beyond something which, is, which has got qualities and God is beyond something which is devoid of qualities. This means we cannot explain verbally what God is. We can only try to experience, and when we experience, then we understand that God is beyond explanation. So that's why he says, <coughs> this is the path of negation. In his own language, The true purpose of human life is to, like God, which is to say to realize absolute detachment, 
what is detachment detaching ourselves from anything that could be expressed in terms of convention we called we called it the path of negation means the rea that reality is beyond expression now uh, i shall uh, try to explain this he for example explains that god is present in everything this god in creatures is not pantheism but it's an expression of what in human terms is active contemplation so when a kant thought a kant thought that god is present in in creatures what he meant was that god is the essence of all creatures which is called in vedanta andaryamitvam or the fact that god is present in everything to realize this we need scriptures we need books but books are only a, a means to realize something which is beyond books when do we realize this truth when we are endowed with certain spiritual qualities so that's why you know he said god made all things through me when i had my existence in the unfathomable ground of god and then he says to realize this truth we we need three important qualifications which is called three essences when the soul goes in search of the kingdom of god taking christ as the model it has to free itself of the essence of the creature so when you want to enter the kingdom of god you should be you should cease to be what you are physically and mentally because you should try to become what you are in spirit or you should become your true essence that's what he says so so he says you know when the soul goes in search of the kingdom of god taking christ as a model it has to free itself of the essence of creature god is present in all creatures but our nature our characteristics as a creature should be transcended to understand the reality of god one discipline the second is delivering the soul of its attachment to the essence of christ as the eternal archetype the masters teach that the archetype of the soul is a divine under understanding one of the great points of dispute between uh, eckhart and the traditional clergy was eckhart tried to transcend the personal the empirical aspects of god expressed in terms of the trinity so he talked about one being god here one supreme reality and when we realize that reality then we understand god is present in all of us so that's why he was accused of being uh, uh, influenced by pantheistic idea pantheism means equating world with god world with divine so when he taught that we can realize the essence of god within our own heart when we transcend empirical when we acquire these characteristics we can reach the highest experience he was accused of questioning the mediation the essential mediation of the clergy or jesus christ but actually he was actually elevating spiritual experience as something that goes beyond the ecclesiastical the hierarchical demands and compulsions the third essence from which the soul is to be freed is the primordial divine nature which manifests as the father the master said that god the father becomes conscious of the nature of his nature 
the extent to which he is the origin of the of the eternal world and of all creatures a can't did accept at one level that god is the creator of the world the god the creator is only one particular view of god which should be transcended to experience the presence of god within us and that god in the ultimate analysis goes beyond trinity these are some of the views which actually brought him into conflict with the ecclesiastical authorities you know something very similar you find in in advaitic tradition of shankaracharya in the vega chudamani shankaracharya says four essential qualifications are necessary for you to be a spiritual seeker one we must first of all have a clear understanding of what is real and we must hold fast to the real and we must give up our attachment to the unreal by the unreal often it is in a way understood to be the world and all these things everything other than god is unreal but he did not mean that the world our external practices all these things are meaningless what he said was that from the highest experience point of view external practices have no relevance just as when you go to kindergarten you have to learn the alphabet but when you go beyond that then you transcend that early stage of your education not that it becomes unreal it becomes relative so he uh, approaches the reality from three perspectives the absolute reality which is equivalent to what uh, uh, eckhart called the god should the being the reality that goes beyond our interpretation of the reality as father in heaven son or holy ghost and so on they are not unreal so long as you believe this world is the supreme reality then the reality of god as the creator of this world is real but the moment you transcend that stage and when you start experiencing the reality within ourselves then we go to a higher level of understanding uh, i can give one example uh, something because uh, maybe much more easy to understand there has one uh, great german philosopher who lived in 19th century was johann gottlieb fichte he was a great admirer of kant and also hegel and uh, he i can just quote one uh, interesting uh, teaching from uh, his quote teachings which he actually took from the teachings of eckhart uh fichte says for example the reality covers itself within a veil of the unreal the absolute reality the divine essence expresses itself in the form of the unreal what does it mean the world is unreal in the ultimate analysis it doesn't mean that the world is totally absolutely non existent what it means is it is only relative according to vedanta and also according to eckhart the absolute reality transcends time space and causes if anything belongs to time it is real only in the relative sense and then it should have a cause and it also should become an a cause of its effect so the cause effect link is real only in the relative sense not in the absolute sense behind the cause effect link there is the reality which is called the uncaused cause in vedanta and also in the language of eckhart and it is a cause but it doesn't have its own cause it is the ever immortal eternal reality it was it is not created 
because there was no time when it did not exist and it cannot cease to exist because there will be no time when it will not exist. So he used the word detachment. Once we understand the highest reality as devoid of what you call describability, when it cannot be described, it cannot be explained, it, it is, cannot be verbalized, then we understand reality as our own essence, which is called the path of negation. And this path of negation is very much a part of Vedantic tradition. It's called neti, neti, naiti, not this, not this. Of removing all that is relative or unreal in the absolute sense, that you reach a point when you cannot deny, you cannot deny yourself, you, the, the negator cannot deny himself. If I go on telling it, that's not true, that's not true, who am I who is making the statement that's not true? At least I should be real in comparison to what I try to say or assert as something as unreal. So that reality cannot be negated. So this path of negation was, a, was an important uh, approach that you find in uh, Eka. Another very unique, which I already mentioned at the very beginning, uh, the unique contribution of Eckhart was his idea of accommodating revealed scriptures, reason, and also going beyond that inner experience, which is essentially the essence of Advaita. Srutya, Yuktya, Swanabhutya. In Vedantic tradition in Shankaracharya's philosophy, you find you listen to the scriptures, Bible in the context of Christianity, or Vedas in the context of Hindu, Vedanta. You listen to the scriptures, the teaching of the scriptures. Then use your reason. You now reasoning is not heresy. He, reasoning is not, not questioning the authority of God. Reasoning is a process of internalizing bring the reality within our reach. So we use reason. But that reasoning is real reasoning, which understands its own limitation. So every true genuine reasoning should take you beyond itself. And beyond reason, there is one's own inner experience. Accommodating the reality of mystical experience within the mainstream of theology was a unique contribution of Eckhart. Of course, we don't know to what extent he succeeded because he lived in 13th century. And if you look at the history of the church ever since, you find uh, it was not always uh, an inner experience as something that goes beyond theology beyond the conventions was not accepted by the mainstream theology of Christianity. Here also in, in Shankaracharya's case also, during his time, there were many opponents whom he had to face. But he asserted that reasoning is necessary. The reasoning should be something that should take you beyond itself. <coughs> Now, another very interesting uh, contribution of Eckhart, Christian theology, he has said that, to say that God created the world yesterday or tomorrow would be foolishness, for God created the world and everything in it in the one present now. Indeed, time that has been passed for a thousand years is as present and near to God as the time that now is, means God is beyond time. If you interpret God as a creator of the world, just as you interpret a goldsmith who produces golden ornaments, then you're attributing a, an essential function to God. 
you are defining god you are explaining god you are limiting god within the straight jacket of definitions if you define god then you are making the infinite finite you are bringing god from the infinite to the level of the finite that's so good that finds his expression in shankaracharya's commentaries what he says is this anything that you explain or describe or, ex- or verbalize is called the panja shabda pravrti means five types of verbalization in vedanta non dualism five types of verbalization you can explain something in relation to what it does or to what it is related to or what its characteristics are or to what species it belongs or what it does what its its function so dravya jati guna karma sambandha etc means five conditions of verbalization a card says if you believe that god can be defined as the creator of this world and if your whole understanding of the de- description of god is only as a creator of this world and this world is changing which is finite everyone knows then you are bringing the indescribable to the level of something that could be described you are trying to define something which is beyond definition so that's why he says you know the eternal now eternal means timelessness the infinite now i tell you one something very interesting and that is what bridges what connects a card with shankaracharya when you listen to these high sounding philosophical ideas as many of us may look upon that way we should remember he doesn't reject other area other paths that's something very interesting he fully accepts the value of scriptures theology biblical teachings but what he says is we have to go beyond it we have to go beyond institutions we have to internal internalize we have to bring god to the level of our everyday day to day experience god is present in everything not in a pantheistic sense but in a very transcendental sense god is our essence god is omnipresent because god is immanent so omnipresence through immanence that's why he said god is present in all creatures everything but we should transcend our limitations as creatures to realize the presence of god within us so we had to remember his path to us not rejecting other methods rituals are necessary ceremonies are necessary but beyond that there is a higher stage when god becomes a reality an experience in our everyday life and in fact this is the essence of mysticism when you transcend institutions man made institutions taboos rules and regulations when it becomes a real a matter of real experience that guides our every thought every thought every deed then god becomes a reality that's what you are trying to expound the language may be different see shankara going to shankara chari you find the discipline as you mentioned you know uh, holding fast what is real and going beyond giving up what is unreal then total renunciation of any desire having absolutely no desire for any kind of worldly enjoyments or heavenly enjoyments then perfect control restraint discipline of mind senses emotions and feelings and finally a strong desire for liberation these are four disciplines according to vedanta and eckhart in his own language summarizes these four into three which i already mentioned earlier 
Just as the eternal now of Eckhart, Shankara insists on the instant or silence between two thoughts as the reality with which we have to integrate. That means when we go beyond thoughts, when we experience the highest reality, then our mind na naturally goes to the transcendent. So the interval between two thoughts, where there is no thought, a complete silence. That's called, I mean, be going beyond words, beyond expressions. The indescribability of inner experience. Now, another very important area where uh, you find striking similarities between uh, these, uh, between the great uh, German mystic and Shankaracharya is this. <coughs> that is their ethical philosophy. You find uh, a very strong tendency, even uh, a great interpreter like Rudolf Otto, um, and even Fitzer, uh, you know, Johann Gottlieb uh, Fitzer, uh, have tried to, Fichte is pronounced in German maybe, uh, have tried to uh, imply that Vedanta, Advaita, non-dualism, doesn't give importance to ethical philosophy. I mean, uh, empirical duties and responsibilities and how we should, inter uh, I mean, we should <coughs> interact with others. Now, Eckhart, of course, insists on ethical philosophy. I mean, loving uh, all the fundamental teachings of Jesus Christ, builds a Buddha, he builds ethical philosophy. In Vedanta, the, I mean, the ethical philosophy, ethics is built upon the spiritual unity of humanity of creation. The idea of the spiritual oneness of creation is the uh, philosophical foundation of ethical philosophy in Vedanta. Uh, in Eckhart, it is the reality of the presence of God in all creatures. I mean, Vedanta, it is the reality of the spiritual unity of existence. So there are many, many, uh, many uh, places in the works of Shankaracharya where he brings out this idea. Even Swami Vivekananda, you know, the infinite oneness of the soul is the eternal sanction of all morality, all ethics, and all good actions. Vivekananda expounds his own language, practical Vedanta. But the Shankaracharya's works, you find there's a, a famous verse in the, uh, in the commentary on the Mandukya Upanishad called Mandukya Kari Gaitisa. <coughs> so Siddhanta Vivasthasu Devidino Nishidadadam Parasparam Virudhyanti Taihi Ayana Viruti. This is the verse. What it implies is this. Those who, who believe that their path alone is the right path and all other paths are wrong, they fight among themselves because they believe that every other path is wrong. We have to remember one important point, you know. Vedanta does not believe in the doctrine of, or the theory of evil. Vedanta believes in the doctrine of ignorance. Uh, even Eckhart, to some extent, uh, can, could not liberate himself from the baggage of the doctrine of evil. Uh, so he also speaks about uh, sin at the finite level. So, but he also admits that going beyond the finite, when you realize the presence of the divine in all creatures, then you also uh, recognize the spiritual unity of creation. So when you transcend the duality, when you transcend the, uh, the empirical, when you reach the non-dualistic, the transcendental, then naturally you, uh, you accept the spiritual oneness or unity of creation. And that realization is the essence of a kind of universal ethical philosophy. Coming to Shankaracharya, he says, for example, uh, it is impossible for a spiritual seeker 
to quarrel with anyone because atma ananyatva that is the word he understands the reality the spiritual essence in everyone and everything is one so how can we quarrel with ourselves it's like you hit your head with your own hand and you are going to going to feel the pain your head will be somebody else then only you can hit him but you yourself so if you transcend the 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 relative the dualistic the empirical and if you reach the idea of god as present in all creatures when you transcend the finite when you even transcend your definition of god as the creator of the world when you re- realize god as the immanent and the omnipresent then that realization itself becomes a solid foundation of a universal spiritual ethics which was not acceptable to the tradition which actually brought him into trouble so that's a, that's why shankarajari suktiya yuktiya swanabhutiya listen to the scriptures he doesn't deny as shankaracharya believed in the validity of scriptures the vedas he had also believed in the validity of biblical scriptures and shankaracharya brought into prominence the validity of reason reasoning because reasoning is a process of internalizing bringing what we read about what we talk about into within the realm of our own intellectual understanding with the first step towards internalization inner experience bringing to inner experience once we do that then that opens the door to mystical experience and at the myst- at the level of mystical experience god and the world is realized to be one now if you find any difference apparent contradiction it's all due to the 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 culture or the values the social anthropological values conventions which are uh, different from uh, the place where shankaracharya taught his philosophy 500 years before eckhart and uh, the the conditions the circumstances in which eckhart teaches philosophy for eckhart it was some he was bringing something new for shankaracharya he was bringing out the best of the vedas and after experiencing in his life he was building a compact elaborate philosophical system so that's why often sri shankaracharya says brahma satyam jagat mithya jeevo brahma eva na parivan brahma is only brahma is only reality this world itself is unreal unreal means relative not no means not eternal that's the idea now elsewhere the same uh, scripture in fact munto munto govanishad says brahma vedam vishvam idam varishtham this world itself is brahman another statement this is a very interesting um, approach it takes little understanding of the dialectical polemic polemical background of the two contrasting philosophical systems on the one hand the central doctrine of non non dualism or advaita is brahman atman is only reality this world everything else is only relative that means unreal from the highest point of view called mithya that belongs to time space and causes this is one state but in the muntu upanishad in other vedic uh, vedic literature there are statements which tell you all this is brahman itself so how do you understand this here you can find the evolution the progression from philosophy to experience at a philosophical level we assert atman the all pervading reality is only absolute reality all these empirical world, world all these mountains valleys oceans all these are only relative 
a little esoterical. But when, he, when this philosophical conviction becomes an inner experience, then what happens, you know, this world as such is itself recognized as non-distinct from Brahman because a liberated soul looks at the world not as a combination of names and forms, he looking at the world as the all-pervading reality. So a liberated soul looks at the world after detaching names and forms from the world. If you remove the varieties or differences based on names and forms, if you look at the world, then the world is actually the same essence. But this is only at the experience level. That's why Brahma Satyam Jagat Satyam is the experience. Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya is philosophy. At the highest experience level, when you realize the all-pervading reality, then you don't see the world as we see the world. The world is seen to be non-distinct and non-different from the all-pervading Brahman. So that's why a Khan said, God in creatures, but then the moment you transcend your, you go beyond your understanding of God as the, as the creator of the creatures or creation, then you find God is seen everywhere. So that is the evolution from, uh, myst from philosophy to mysticism. <coughs> okay, I can, I, I, I want to tell you a few more things about these two, of course, within a very limited time, it is impossible. Uh, we have to remember when great, two great philosophers uh, who had the courage to uh, go beyond the conventions, beyond the uh, institutions of which they were the products. Uh, very often you find the language, the vocabulary may differ depending upon the circumstances, and also the theological traditions into which they are born. Both Eckhart and Shankaracharya were the products of the circumstances, the philosophical, spiritual landscape in which they were born. But they also gave sh a new shape to the philosophical tradition of which they were a product. That's what a mystic does. A philosopher cannot do that. A philosopher interprets. But a mystic gets a new insight into the philosophical ideas. That's why, you know, from rituals to mythology to philosophy, and they're mostly religious traditions, I mean, received religious traditions, and then. But great men like Eckhart and Shankaracharya could evolve even beyond philosophy and they could reach the uh, highest mystical level. And Shankaracharya, what Shankaracharya did was he built a huge edifice, a multi-story structure. And then he built staircases for you to climb the steps to reach the top level. He also built a gave you a ladder you can use. So in Shankaracharya's life, you find the, mo the, the most elaborate, the grossest forms of ceremonials, he says, okay. Prayers and practices external, okay. But you should not stop there. That's what a mystic does. A philosopher, on the other hand, says, well, this system is right, that system is wrong. When you reach, a, when you reach the mystical level, then, you ri then they realize that if A is right, B need not necessarily be wrong. B also can be right from another perspective. But uh, but the philosoph philosophical level, it is not possible. At the philosophical level, if A is right, 
then we cannot be right you cannot have two rights if one is right the other should be wrong there cannot be two firsts but at a mystical level what happens you know it's like reaching the top of the hill when you reach the top of the hill when you look down then you find so many roads that people take depending upon their preferences from different directions so many trails people are walking following different trails and tracks to reach the same top of the hill but if you are not reach the top of the hill if you take for to walking through the track or the trail you think this is only road but you can't see other roads to see other roads other trails you should reach the top and then walk look down mystical experience is the top of the hill of spiritual life and that's why a cart could teach such a universal spiritual philosophy going beyond conventions and that was shankaracharya teach so uh, when you reach the top level of experience then you understand that every path can be an equally valid path for us to follow a can't lay down three important disciplines and shankaracharya laid down four disciplines of his an intense desire uh, for liberation is the most important motive in the case of ekhart if one wants to enter the kingdom of heaven then one should leave behind everything else so anyway uh, i have tried uh, is a adventure to put together the ideas of these two great uh, uh, spiritual colossus spiritual giants uh, who spoke of the same truth but in two different languages thank you namaskar <coughs> om shanti
Supreme Reality is immanent in the whole creation. 